I'm joined today with NFL kicker, Super Bowl victor, Harrison Butker, a devout Christian, a devout Catholic. He serves the traditional Latin mass, and I think we were all blown away during the Super Bowl when he kicked with eight seconds left, kicked the winning field goal, and the scapular comes out. Harrison, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Glad to be back on. So I got to ask the big question before we get into all this. People want to hear you talk about your faith, your faith in Christ, uh, your family, your values, your standards, uh, Super Bowl, NFL, but the scapular. I mean, has that ever happened to you before? The scapular just flies out like miraculously? First time. And <laughs> it's funny. I'm on my sixth season now. And I would normally, I don't like to admit this, I would normally take it off for the games and for practices the first five seasons. So this was the first year where I wore it the entire season. It never popped out at all, but I think the Blessed Mother wanted her name to be known. She wanted her scapular to be known. And the biggest kick of my career happened to be the time when the scapular came out for the first time. So I think that was a great witness that she was able to use me to show the beauty of the faith, the beauty of the brown scapular. And obviously I should have been wearing the brown scapular every season of my career. So any athletes out there, don't, don't take it off. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, people always talk about wardrobe malfunction during the Super Bowl uh, in years past, but this was the best one of all time. And again, you can't plan this. Definitely. Things. Okay, so. No, I hope the NFL does find me for a uniform violation, <laughs> having uh, the Blessed Mother out and, and advertise there. But it'd be totally worth it. <laughs> yes. Okay, so eight seconds left. I mean, did you know you are going to get the kick? I know sometimes you feel really confident going, and sometimes you're, you're nervous. How did you feel going into that kick? You know, I'd, I'd like to say I'm a robot, and I don't have – any human emotions. I don't get nervous at all. But for a big kick like that, for any kick, I do get nervous because it's a it's a big moment that I've prepared for for ever since I started kicking a ball sophomore year of high school. I've prepared for the biggest moments of my career. I practice as hard as I can. I try to make every kick a big kick. So when I'm in practice and I'm warming up, even before the team period, I try to put pressure on each kick. But even doing that, you still get to a big moment like a game winning kick in the Super Bowl and you still have the, have the nerves. But I think that's where the foundation in Christ and your faith comes into play because if I've prepared as best as I can for that moment and I'm ready to go, then whatever happens, and I've been praying about it and praying for God's will to be done, I, I truly believe that whatever happens there, whether I make or miss that kick, God's going to use me to glorify him however he wants and if I need to miss that kick and grow in virtue, he's going to allow that. But it does give me peace going out to that kick, despite all the nerves, knowing that his will is going to be done. And no matter what, I can be happy with that end result. Yeah. H have you thought about the inverse? Like, what if you had missed that kick? Of, of, of course. <laughs> I mean, um, you, <laughs> you have to be ready for that to happen mm -hmm. because – if all you want is to have success, which, you know, because of our pride, because of our vanity, we want to have worldly success. We want those things, but we have to be prepared for when it doesn't happen. And how do we handle that? If, if even the thought of thinking about missing the game winning kick in the Super Bowl is going to put me into a bad place of depression and I can't even function because. everyone knows who I am because I missed that kick. And then where's my faith? Where's my foundation? I should be happy with any result. And it could be a beautiful way for our Lord to push me in humility. And at the end of the day, my work could be the, the means for me to grow in virtue and to hopefully attain the beatific vision. Wow. Amazing. So what was your thought when you saw it go through? <laughs> I'm glad it went through because I missed the, the earlier kick. Uh, that was not a fun experience. Again, humility. Mm -hmm. We can always grow in it. I, I was obviously glad it went through, but I knew there's still eight seconds on the clock. We got to kick off, and, and hopefully they don't get a, a Hail Mary uh, pass and, and score a touchdown and, and win the game. But I was very glad that it went through selfishly, and I'm just very 
uh, fortunate to be in this position to be a part of the Chiefs organization and to have had so much success in only six seasons. Yeah, it's it's remarkable. Now, can I can we still go back and talk about the missed kick? You know, I think that's a good analogy. I don't want to spiritualize too much, you know, but we think about our own lives, you know, where St. Paul says we're running this race. There is an athletic analogy in sacred scripture and uh, we do miss, you know, we do fall short, but even in this, in this life, our Lord gives us this moment. You could say eight seconds left to redeem the game. Have you thought about that? Have you, have you expressed that? Or, I mean, it's a great thing to talk about with your kids even. Well, yeah, if we just look at that one game, I missed a makeable field goal in the first quarter, maybe it was second quarter, first half, that would have put us up in the game. Throughout the game, I can't help but think, you know, if only I had made that kick, we would have been winning, we would have had three more points. All those thoughts are going through my head, and I'm trying not to think about them. I'm trying to focus on focus on the process, what I can control, what's going to help me make the kick. But we face adversity all throughout our life in a bigger picture the whole season i had some big misses there i got injured and i was struggling the temptation though for me was to get really upset kind of throw in the towel i don't want to say i wanted to to quit it all that's not the case but you you get down on yourself and it's tough to show up every day and give that amount of effort because i am giving a lot of effort and i'm missing kicks so do I say, I'm not going to try. I'm not going to use my talents anymore. I'm just going to step back and say, you know what, God, it's in your hands. If you want me to make it, then it'll go in. That, that's the temptation. But I, I really believe that we have to use our talents. We have to use our, we have to put in a lot of effort to be the best. And then God will take control. But I did I did there and I did not give up, but I wanted to stop putting that effort every single day. And if you take that to an even bigger perspective with just our, our life, struggling in a marriage, struggling with our children, struggling in prayer, do we continue to try to optimize every day, be efficient, stay on that spiritual game plan? Or do we give up and say, Lord, I'm not receiving these consolations. I'm just going to not pray anymore. Or my marriage is really tough. I'm trying to work on it with my wife. I'm just going to stop trying to have those conversations with her, or, you know, the children, they wear me out. They don't appreciate me. I'm going to push them away. So that's kind of what I'm getting at when it comes with the football. It's easy to just say, I'm completely done with this. I've had enough, but because of my foundation in Christ, because of the inner circle that was around me, I trusted in our Lord. I trusted in God's plan. And I, I don't mean to say that like, oh, I trusted that he was going to bring this success to me. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say, I trusted in his plan that he was going to bring fruits from this small suffering and maybe from great suffering of missing a game-winning kick, right? I, th I do believe that his will, no matter if it brings success or failure, is better than our own will. And at the end of the day, he cares about balls going through the uprights so that he can glorify, so that I can glorify him and do good with that. But at the end of the day, he doesn't really care. I don't think about, you know, Harrison, I want you to have this record and make this contract money. I, I don't believe that. I think... I'm supposed to evangelize in my role as a football player and that he'll use me and and hopefully I'm able to grow in virtue and be a saint one day because of all the challenges that I faced as a football kicker. Amazing. Yeah, that, that, it's beautiful. And I, I just, it, it's amazing to hear someone at the top of their game because so often in life, you know, if something's a really big deal, like, well, this is the Super Bowl of business deals or this is the Super Bowl of this and that. And like, we're literally talking about the Super Bowl, and to hear an NFL star, I mean, you're a star, you're a champ, to say God is greater than this, Christ is greater than this is, I mean, it's, it's powerful. I think people need to hear this. I, I'm just curious, though, when, when, when all this happened, yeah, you I'm, first talked to Patrick Mahomes after the game, what, what, what was said? I'm sure you gave a high five or something, but what was said? He just said congratulations. He was going around to the whole locker room and congratulating guys. In this sport, the quarterback probably is the, the biggest deciding factor of winning a game, of losing a game, of, of winning, of having a great season and winning the Super Bowl or not. So he is our leader. And, you know, he, he congratulated me. But I think back to the Texans game. I missed a game-winning kick 
we eventually won the game, so that was good in overtime. But I missed the game-winning kick, and he could tell that I was frustrated and, and kind of down about it. And he came up to me, and he just said, Harrison, we have all the faith in you. We trust you as a kicker. You're our guy, and you're going to have some big kicks when we get to the playoffs. And sure enough, the AFC Championship game and the Super Bowl, there were big kicks there. So it meant a lot to have the support from my friends, my family, from my teammates when there was a lot of chaos outside of uh, the facilities, outside of this close-knit group. But you can't listen to that. you got to listen to the voices that matter the most. And as a kicker, you're only as good as the positions you get in. So if I do get in the position to hit a game-winning kick, I need to be ready. And obviously, Patrick, the offense, did a great job setting it up. The defense obviously had a great game as well. And then I have to do my job and, and make the kick. What does your, your wife and your kids think of all this? <laughs> My wife would love it if I was not a public figure. She does <laughs> not. There's a lot of things you have to deal with just going around and I'm getting recognized. And if I'm with my children, I'm with my wife. I want to be present with them. But if, if I'm having people come up to me, which I love, I want to be able to communicate with them. But at the same time, well, now my wife and the children, they're off on their own. Who knows what's going on there? I can't be as present with them when I'm getting pulled from all different directions. So she would love it if I wasn't a public figure, if I wasn't recognized in Kansas City. But I, I do believe that she sees how God is working through me. Again, I mentioned this earlier, but I don't think I'd be the man that I am today if it wasn't for me being a kicker because it's allowed me to grow so much. It's tested me so much. And, you know, this road to sainthood is not going to be easy. It's going to come with a lot of tribulations, a lot of trials. And she's recognized that instead of football being this, you know, distraction from family life that pulls me away from them, it's actually helping me to be a better husband and a better father. And for that, I'm very grateful. And it's taken now a while for us to really accept that, that God wants me here to help me grow in my faith and in my vocation, and not just as this side gig that I do um, and then I come home and I'm a husband and father, right? This is just kind of part of God's plan of how he wants me to hopefully, you know, be with him one day in heaven. Yeah. Now we had done a, an interview several years ago and uh, you talked some about your Catholic faith. I mean, can you tell us you know, where you raised Catholic and, you know, when did you, <coughs> you know, you went through college, you had to rediscover your faith. Uh, eventually you found the traditional Latin mass. I'd love to talk about that, but what's your background? So I was raised Catholic. Both sets of my grandparents are Catholic. We, we grew up going to mass every Sunday. That was definitely a part of our lives. When I started playing year round soccer, there was a lot of long weekends, a lot of traveling. And because of that, we weren't, it wasn't convenient to go to mass on Sunday. So we would miss every now and then. And I think from an early age, I started to understand that football or sorry, soccer and sports might be more important than going to mass on Sunday. So from an early age, that was kind of getting registered into me. And, and I don't like I say this enough and all the lessons that they, they taught me, but you almost can't even fault them because it's just a generational thing that I, I think has been passed down. And the catechesis has been so bad. The, the knowledge is just not there that, you know, it's a mortal sin if you don't go to mass on Sunday. That's basic Baltimore catechism, right? And a lot of that is just not communicated. So stopped going to mass every Sunday when I was doing traveling soccer. And then when I went to college, I had football practices, weight room, uh, and I wasn't going to going to inconvenience myself by going to mass. So I, I fell away from the faith. I still would pray. I still recognize God and, and Jesus Christ as the son of God, but I didn't understand why it was necessary for me to go to mass, why it was necessary for me to receive the sacraments. I thought, just go somewhere, go to a church or pray on your own where it makes you feel good, where you feel like you're growing in your relationship. And all those things are good, but that is just the beginning and that should lead you to finding the truth. So it wasn't until my sophomore year at Georgia Tech when there was a walk-on punter, 
Grant Aston, who was on fire for the faith, and he realized that I was Catholic and not going to Mass, and he wanted to go to the Catholic Center and at least introduce me to all the other students there, to the priest, and I reluctantly went, and at first, I did not like the liturgy at all. It was a reverent Novus Ordo Mass, but it was so different from anything I had seen before growing up. Growing up, I had only seen older priests. I had only really seen carpet, churches, guitars in the choir that were right next to the altar. That was kind of my experience. And then I go to Georgia Tech, their Catholic center there, and there's a scola. The priest would sometimes celebrate ad orientum. There was a gold crucifix. There were no altar girls. They were wearing cassocks and surplices. Um, So immediately I felt like this was otherworldly. This was not something that I could walk into a everyday Protestant church and see these things. It was very different, and that intrigued me. So I started asking a lot of questions. I met with the priest there who, that was the first time I had seen a priest that was, you know, under the age of 50. It was a man that I thought was, uh, you know, could could be a father figure for me at least. That was a manly man that, that could be a, uh, you know, a, a father to actual children, not just spiritual children. So, Right there, I had a role model that was a priest. I never had that before, and I started discussing these topics with him. First time, these kind of traditional Catholic beliefs that most priests would run away from, that wouldn't want to expound upon because it kind of would bring shame to the church, or you know, they would say, "Oh, the church is kind of changing. We don't believe these things anymore." But he believed in the teachings of the of the faith, and he didn't shy away from them. And he would communicate them, you know, privately to me when we would meet or in his homilies. And I kept growing in my interest for the faith. So at that point, it was intellectual. And then I finally said, well, all these things sound right. They sound like the Catholic Church is the church established by Jesus. It sounds like these sacraments have power that the priest can actually turn bread and wine into his body and blood. Why don't I give um, confession a chance? So I went to confession for the first time. I looked at an examination of conscience that was very thorough, and I sat down, and I wrote down all my sins, and I confessed them. And I know we shouldn't just be attached to feelings and consolations, but the way I felt coming out of confession was a feeling that I never wanted to lose. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think I started my journey of growing in holiness. I was finally in a state of grace, and now... I can start this game plan to continue to pray and grow. And from that point on, it completely changed my life. It changed my relationship with my, um, with my girlfriend, who's now my wife. She was brought into the faith. It, it changed who I was at the core. And it was so beautiful. And I don't want to ever lose, you know, my connection to the faith, my connection to the sacraments. That is the vine and we are the branches. And I don't want to be cut off. So now... You fast forward, I've gotten married. I have two children. This church is my rock, and I wouldn't be anything without that. And how old were you when you made that confession? I would have been sophomore year of college. So I'm pretty young for my grade. So I was probably 20. Yeah, 20. 20. Now, what would you say to, to, there's probably people who are are finding this video, they're evangelicals, they're Protestants, they go to Bible churches, and they're saying, wow, Harrison, he he loves God, he loves Christ, he has faith, he's trying to, you know, incorporate uh, who God is and his plan for his life and everything he does, including in this, in this game. But they're like, you went to confession. I mean, I know you know your theology, explain what confession is to people. Growing up, my understanding of confession was completely incorrect. I thought that confession was a place where you could go with a priest who ideally knows God, he's a good Christian man, and you can just talk about your sins, and you can talk about how do I need to be a better Christian, what can I change? It's just kind of a round table, if you will, with these two people in a box. And then when I started listening to these homilies, when I started talking one-on-one with the priest at Georgia Tech, I started to realize, well, if the priest can make the body and the, the, sorry, the bread and the wine and the body and blood, well, he has to do that. 
sense that he has the power then to forgive our sins. And I don't... Oh, oh sorry. You still with me? Oh, I lost you. We lost your audio. Uh, Here we go. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Sorry, I muted myself for a second. But the, the priest has the power to do things. And I would say, if you are Protestant, you do believe that a pastor or maybe a friend can, has the power to baptize. So God has given them the power to do that. God has given a minister the power to marry two people. Wouldn't it make sense that God could give the power to a man to forgive someone of their sins? And I don't know the exact place in the Bible where Christ talks about this, but he said to his disciples who have been given this power to go baptize, and we could talk about the Eucharist, but at least to baptize, he said, the sins that you retain will be retained and the sins that you forgive will be forgiven. So he's yeah. saying that there are sins that someone could confess to you that you actually don't forgive, right? He, he could have, Jesus, our Lord, could have easily said, just pray to me that your sins will be forgiven and I'll forgive them. But no, he, he, he added this intermediary, yeah. which we believe to be our priests. Our priests are the ones that have the power to forgive our sins. So it's much more than just this discussion between two people about how to clean up your sins. There really is the ability to forgive sins, and you, be, you begin now this journey uh, in a state of grace, and Protestants believe that we become in a state of grace when we get But if we commit a mortal sin, we lose that. So how do we get that? We have infinitely separated ourselves with, from our Lord. We need his grace to come back. So we need a minister to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. If people want to look that up, it's John chapter 20, verse 20 through 22, I believe. And Jesus breathes on the apostles. This is on Easter, the first, sun, first resurrection Sunday. He breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. Whoever sins you retain are retained. It's right there in the Bible. And I mean, I used to be a Protestant and you, you read that as a Protestant. You're like, well, what does that mean? He gave the Holy Spirit and gave power to men to declare the forgiveness of sins amongst other sinners. It's, it's profound. And, and yet the Catholic church knows exactly what that means. And, and we need not just to confess our sins, but we need to hear a representative of Jesus Christ say, I absolve you. Your sins are forgiven. It's it's very powerful, and and it's amazing. You got that consolation, and then this started, I guess, this journey from when you were about twenty to here you are now. And then over time, I'm guessing you were introduced to the traditional Latin Mass and a more traditional, normative Catholic piety. Correct. So we had. Uh a great young man that's now in seminary about to be ordained a priest that created a, a men's night where we would all get together and we would cook dinner and just sit around and talk. He would do that once a week, we would get together. And then one, t one time he suggested that we all go to the fraternity parish and experience the traditional Latin mass. And I was so pumped up because this is the mass that had been celebrated for so many centuries and I had never seen it before. I also thought, back to my, you know, I'm thinking of my grandparents. I'm thinking, wow, this is the mass they grew up with. This is so cool that now I'm going to the same mass they did, as well as all of these other saints in the Roman Rite. And at first, you know, similar to the first time I went to the Novus Ordo Mass, when I almost didn't feel welcome, it felt very different. It was, it kind of, you know, put me off, but it also interested me. That's how it was when I went to the traditional Latin Mass, because there was probably this sense of pride that I'm Catholic now, I'm in a state of grace, I go to this Reverend Nova Sordo, and then you go to traditional Latin Mass and you have all these questions. What is this? You know, what are all these things? I have so many questions, but again, it brought interest to me and it started me on this journey of men looking at the history of the liturgy, the history of these ecumenical councils and what happened with the Second Vatican Council and why we have two Roman rites and what are the differences, what got changed. So when I started looking down into our history, I wanted to attend the mass that so many saints had attended that to me seemed like it had been organically developed that wasn't almost created where there weren't these things that were, these chunks that were taken out and then these chunks that were added. I wanted to attend the mass that was developed through so many centuries and was 
was the food basically for so many of these great saints that happened in 20, you know, my junior year, junior, senior year of college. And then at the Catholic center, the priest started also celebrating low mass once a week and then went to celebrating a high mass once, once a month. So there was almost this movement among the students at Georgia tech that were clinging to tradition. They saw this traditional Nova Sordo, but they, they wanted more because where does the traditional Nova Sordo come, come from? You know, that comes from the Latin mass. So it was a very beautiful um, uh, experience for me to, to, to go to the fraternity parish, to see the traditional Latin mass. And I've just seen so much fruit from being able to attend uh, the Latin mass. And it's really pushed me to grow as a husband and a father because, you know, you, you hear people that will say, uh, people that go to the Latin Mass or X, Y, and Z, they have all these thoughts on them. I think that comes from the, the surprise of going from a Novus Ordo parish, a normal Novus Ordo parish where everyone's shaking hands in the, sanctu in the sanctuary or the nave, they're talking, they're having a fun time, this is a community event, and then you go to a traditional Latin Mass and everyone, for the most part, is very serious. They're all prayerful. They've, they've almost removed their personalities. They are in the pews, and they are trying to connect with our Lord and be attentive as best as possible during the Mass. And because of that, if you're, say, not used to it, you think, wow, everyone here is so mean. They're rigid. They're not nice. That, to be the case, and... And when you do others, when you start to get to know these men, they've really grown and strived to be better husbands, better fathers. You talk about how they handle situations with their children, how they handle things in the house with their wives. Seeing that side of it has been so powerful for me as well. And it's something that I, I normally don't see and I don't experience in uh, some of the other parishes that I've been to that don't have the traditional Latin Mass. Yeah. Now, your, your wife, she was not raised Catholic, and she eventually came along with you into the traditional Latin Mass and into tradition. So what was that like? Was there any, any friction there or confusion, or did things the Holy Ghost prepare the way and it went, went easy? There was definitely some friction mm -hmm. because I went from being a uh, very— sinful person. I'm still a sinful person, but at least I was striving. I had a game plan to be closer to our Lord. So when I put this game plan together, and I, I, I love saying that because of, of sports, you have a game plan for playing in a game. You should have a game plan for being a saint. But I was praying more often. I was trying to avoid sin. I was trying to grow in virtue. All these things were foreign to her, and it, it pushed her away. And granted, I could have been a lot more charitable with how I was handling things. I had this truth, but I was still trying to learn how do I spread the truth with charity. So it, it distanced us at, at first, but she started praying the rosary. She didn't tell me about it, but she started praying the rosary and that really changed her life. I think it gave her a foundation. It gave her some peace. And then she wanted to become Catholic and she became Catholic and she's come along with me, obviously as my wife through this journey of, going to the traditional Latin mass of striving to be the best mother, the best wife that she can be, not being stagnant, not saying I'm, I'm checking all the boxes. No, how can I be better in my vocation? And for me, how can I be better in my vocation? So we've both grown together there, but it did take her a while to, to want to be open to the Holy Spirit and open to the faith. But if you talk to her, she'll say it, it was pretty clear when she started to think about how every Protestant church teaches something different. And if you go to a Protestant church and you have your pastor up there giving a sermon, well, who gives him the authority to interpret the Bible and say, this is what our local church here believes? At the end of the day, it's not unified and every Protestant church is different. So I think what attracted her initially was the fact that the Catholic church was unified in their beliefs under a pope and had this 2000 years of tradition that we can always go back to and say, we can't lose this. You know, what once was, you know, will always, always will be. Right. Yeah. That's beautiful. And, and one of the things that, you know, when, when your name comes up, especially, you know, traditional Latin master goals, they've seen the photos of you serving 
the traditional Latin mass. And some people think that's odd. I mean, I, I serve the traditional Latin mass. I, I carry a cassock and surplus with me and, you know, I say, father, you want me to serve? And I serve a lot of people think that's just for like altar boys. Like you gotta be a kid. You gotta be under 16, um, to serve the altar. And I remember reading Thomas More, the great saint martyr even as a man he served mass and so i think it's awesome that you do that how did you learn to serve the traditional at mass because it's pretty hard to do it is hard to do when i was in my rookie year with the chiefs i was trying to go to mass as much as i could throughout the week and i i wasn't too familiar with the fraternity at that point or with the institute. I know I mentioned when I was at Georgia Tech, we went to a fraternity parish, but I didn't really understand, you know, what they were. So the best way I could find the traditional Latin mass was by just looking at diocesan parishes, which I guess the fraternity is a diocesan parish, but maybe I was looking at local parishes that were around me. And if they celebrated the traditional Latin mass, I would go there for both the Novus Ordo or the, the TLM. I didn't really have a preference at that point in my life. But I remember going to a TLM mass and there were no altar boys serving. And I thought, wow, that's a shame. There's so many boys in the pews. This was a diocesan parish. There's so many boys in the pews and they should be up on the altar. They should be striving to glorify our Lord as best as they can. And m most boys would prefer to be up there anyways. But I figured the reason why they're not up there is because they don't know how to serve. And this was a parish where I think they had just started celebrating the Latin Mass. So I, I contacted a priest friend of mine that knew how to celebrate, and he sent me a bunch of resources. And from talking with him, reading those resources and working with the, the priest at the parish, I was able to learn a ton. And then I started training a lot of the boys there. And I think it was a beautiful experience for all the boys. They would they would joke, you know, I, I, I hate serving the Novus Ordo Mass, but I love serving the traditional Latin Mass. And I think the reason for that is because the bar is so high to serving a Latin mass. Even you said it's difficult. You have to memorize. Well, number one, you have to learn how to pronunciate Latin. Then you have to memorize all the prayers. You have to learn all the gestures. You have to know how, how to celebrate a low mass, a high mass, a solemn high mass. You have to know a bunch of different parts, but that was attractive for them to do. And I think as men, as leaders, we should set the bar. Ideally, that's the priest, and I think the priests do set that. If you're a, if you're a boy and you're and you're serving the mass, ideally you have a priest up there who's a good man, a leader, and he's setting the standard. But I think it also helps for there to be older altar servers there, other acolytes that are also setting the standard. I don't think it's a it's a you know little kid thing that that you put your boy in so that they're not messing around in the pews. This is going to help them figure out if they have a vocation of the priesthood. And it's going to create a, a much more virtuous young man. And I think if we just say this is a little kid thing, this is how they participate, well, then that's not going to be good for the parish at all. And we need to strive for excellence. So I am a big advocate for, for boys learning how to serve. And if you are an older gentleman and your wife can take care of the kids, or you don't have any kids, I think it's probably good for you to serve as well. And I will say now that I have two children with a third on the way, I'm, I'm in the pews taking care of the, of the children where I should be. But Taylor, I think you're setting a great example by when you travel, you have a cassock and surplus and you're ready to go whenever. Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. If there's young men, I want them serving. I want vocations of the priesthood. I, I, I'm not going to be like, sit down, kid, I'm serving. I want the kids, the young men to serve. Because we need holy priests. We need vocations. But like you said, sometimes I've been to traditional Latin masses and, and sometimes there's no one serving and, the, and fathers by himself. And I think ideally most priests would like someone to help them with the wine and the water and, you know, to say the responses at the foot of the altar and just, you know, have that. I guess it's kind of like, um, maybe this analogy is wrong. You can tell me, but like when you kick a field goal, there's the guy who like catches the ball and, and sets it up for you, right? Right. And then, I mean, yeah, you need kind of, a little. Yeah. Yeah. You're as the server. I mean, you're, you're kind of the priest does everything right. I mean, he's offering the holy sacrifice, but it's nice to have someone just to make sure that the ball's straight for you so that you can get your job done. And that's kind of how I see being an altar server. And I, I challenge guys like, hey, Harrison's doing it. I'm doing it. Learn the mass. And that way, if you're ever in a situation where a priest, there's no one around, you you can you can help. I mean, you're you're assisting. So 
It's a, it's an act of humility. And I guarantee you almost every time I serve mass, I make a mistake. It's embarrassing. You know, I don't want to, but you know, there's always, you mispronounce something or you forget something and, and, um, you're always learning. So I, it's a great experience to be, to be that close. And I think it's, it's awesome that you do that now. So you said now that you got, you know, you get little kids third on the way, it's hard. You can't just tell your wife, Hey, I'll be up at the altar. See you after math. Yeah. I, I don't know how <laughs> that wouldn't be good. That wouldn't be good for my vocation. No, no not at all. So uh, you're in the NFL, you're traveling around. I mean, the NFL is like the money, the fame, the women, the partying. I mean, you've got to like stand out like a sore thumb in these groups. I mean, what is that like? Do your team teammates are like, Harrison, what, what's the deal with you, man? Why are you so uptight? Does that, does that happen or do they know who you are and respect who you are? I'd like to think the latter. They, they know who I am. They know that I'm devoted to my wife and my children, but there are guys on the team that are married with children and they, and they like to go out and, and have fun and, and party. But that's just not something that I want to be doing, right? I, I spend so much time at the facilities that the, the time that I do have away, I want to make sure it's spent the best way it can be, which normally is with my wife and with the children. So unless I'm bringing them to the nightclubs, which I'm not doing, you know, that's not going to be uh, good, good for, for me. So yeah, I stay away from it. I think the, the way that I've been able to evangelize is, well, number one, I'm young and I'm married. It's very married. So that stands out. And then from there, I think people can see that, well, why, why does he care about that so much? Why does he care about being married? Well, he cares about being married because he wants to have children. Well, why does he want to have children? Well, he wants to have children and have a big family so that he can get them to heaven. And then you have those conversations about, well, what is your faith? Are you Christian? Are you Catholic? Um, and, and they kind of start that conversation and, and figure out where I'm coming from. And, and the Brown Scapular as well. Now that I don't take it off, I mean, you know, I'm wearing it way more than I used to. You know, we're in the locker room. I have it on. People say, what is that brown necklace around your neck? And a lot of times it does come from Protestants. And that's a great opportunity for me to talk about the Blessed Mother and the fact that just because we got baptized doesn't mean we're saved, doesn't mean we're going to heaven. So I wear this because it assures me, the Blessed Mother assures us that if we wear it, we'll have access to the sacraments before our death. So that's a great, uh, great time to evangelize as well. But I'm definitely not going out and partying. And there's a lot of that that goes on. And that's the, the part of the NFL that I try to avoid and, and not take part in because I don't, I don't see many saints, you know, uh, taking part in, in those activities and, and doing very well when they get to the particular judgment. Right. And, and how do you handle, uh, you know, getting access to mass or, you know, the traditional Latin mass with, I mean, you, you're traveling. I mean, I mean, let's be honest, games are usually on Sunday unless it's Monday night football or Thursday. As you've progressed in your career, how do you address that aspect of being a Catholic? Access to mass. Rec right. Recently, we've had a Catholic priest come to the hotel Saturday evenings to celebrate the traditional Latin mass. And that's been beautiful for my spiritual life to have the traditional Latin Mass offered. There is a organization that makes sure that there is a priest available for all the teams on either Saturday evening or Sunday morning. But I found if, if I do want to get the meat and potatoes of our faith, I need the traditional Latin Mass to strengthen me going into a game and just for life in general. But it's difficult when you are a husband and father and you're always away from your family on Sunday. That should be, you've talked about this, that should be the best day of the week for your entire family. And as the father, I'm taken away from that. So it is a struggle. And that's why I enjoy the off season so much because I can be present, but at least I do have access to the traditional mass on Sundays. And I do my best to go to daily mass when I can with the family throughout the week. But it is a tough thing. And I've, I've thought, you know, petitioning to get the games moved away from Sunday. Obviously, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I do feel bad that so many people are not going to church on Sunday. 
because they'd rather go to a football game. And for that, I do feel, you know, <coughs> somewhat guilty. But, you know, that's where God's placed me, I think. And I think he wants me to evangelize in that arena and do my best with the talent he has given me, which is kicking a football, and that happens to be done on Sunday. But I think we should spend our time in the pews before. Yeah. You know, one of the things that you had told me when we weren't on camera is you had the big parade in Kansas City after you won the Super Bowl. And you were saying, in a way, it was surreal because it's it's like some of these people worship the sport, worship the NFL, and even maybe worship the players, worship you. Can you speak to that? Like what that's like to be, I mean, we could say NFL is an idol for a lot of people. I, w I would agree. It's very humbling because you're walking around, I mean, at the parade, everyone's screaming. They're so excited to see you. It does feel like they are treating you like you are a God, like you are an idol. And as a Catholic, you know, you realize that they should have this much passion for our Lord. <clears throat> and unfortunately they've, they've turned that attention to us, the players. But because of that, I need to point my talents towards God and my attempt, the attention that I get towards God as much as I can uh, and try to glorify him. But it is an odd thing. <laughs> it's, it's a very odd thing to be getting that much attention when all you do is a play, is play a sport. So I try to do the best that I, that I can, but at the same time, I'd love it if they had that much enthusiasm and passion for things of the supernatural, for our next life, for getting to know our Lord, his church and the truth, than you know, entertainment, you know, playing football. Yeah. You know, one of the things before the show we talked about, I was like, is there anything you want to shine a light on or, or help promote? And you talked about the, the nuns, the sisters from Gower, uh, Missouri. And it's interesting. Last night we had a, a Bible study here, um, with some guys. And one of the guys was talking about all oh, these beautiful nuns came to town. They were from Gower and all that. And then Today we're talking, you're like, I want to talk about the nuns from Gower. So maybe it, you want to say something about them? Yes. So the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles, my wife and I first heard of that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. They have a lot of great Spotify, beautiful music for Lent, Advent, for Christmas, so definitely go check them out on Spotify. But then we realized, wow, they're in Gower, Missouri. That's only an hour away. So we've grown in our relationship with Mother Cecilia. We love spending time with the sisters whenever we can. And like I said, it's only an hour away. And, and we've been able to go to Mass there. They're, they're very beautiful with their liturgy, the traditional liturgy. Um, they actually have a, a burial place there for unborn babies where we have two of our three miscarried children there as well. And Mother told me a couple months ago that they were looking to build a new monastery dedicated to St. Joseph, and there's going to be a shrine for uh, fathers. Wow. Yeah, uh, that's going to be in Ava, Missouri. It's going to be uh, obviously still Missouri, but they're just doing a lot of great work, and I think everyone should go check out uh, the video that I'm sure you'll provide, Taylor, and, and pray about potentially donating to these these holy sisters that are silently praying in the background for for our souls for the church and they're doing a lot of great work and i just wanted to give them a shout out here for anyone that's that's interested in supporting them whenever that looks like yeah i put a link below if you want to watch their video support them learn about them it's a really beautiful you can see their liturgy you can see what their daily life cycle looks like it's it's very beautiful so check it out all right so one final question for you uh harrison and that is what do you want your legacy to be? A day will come when your leg doesn't work like it does in your 20s. You won't be playing NFL. Maybe you'll be a commentator. Maybe you'll be doing something else, business. But when you're 90 years old, God willing, laying in a bed with a brown scapular on, hopefully, right, preparing for last rites, what would you want your earthly legacy to be? I'd want to make sure that I was content with whatever position, whatever environment God placed me in. You know, I never thought I'd be in the NFL. I never thought I'd be in this environment. 
God wants me to evangelize here. He wants me to use the platform that I've been given for his glory, not my own glory. He wants me to suffer well. He wants me to be able to accept humility. <clears throat> and I think so many people, they'll listen to what I'm saying and they'll say, you know, wow, he's, he's this top NFL player and it's easy for him to talk about success and the blessings of God and all these things. But God's given me a talent to kick a football right now. That, like you said, is going to go away at some point. God's given one person the talent to be able to be a great computer programmer. And that's where God wants that person to glorify him and use his talents well. So I want to be a saint in whatever, wherever I'm placed. Because I know football, the NFL stands for not for long. I'm not going to be here for long. I'm going to go off and do something else. And when I'm 90 years old, I don't care how good of a football player I was. I care about... Number one, am I, strive, am I in a state of grace? Number one, am I in a state of grace? Because I'm about to die soon. Have I loved my wife well? Have I pushed her to be a saint, to get her to get heaven? Have I been open to life? Have I had all these children? Have I been able to be a good father to them, to lead them in the faith, to hopefully get them to heaven? Have I been charitable with my time and my resources? Have I taken advantage of all these great talents that God has given me? Because I am nothing without him. And when you've been given a lot of talents, you can't just keep them and hold on to them. We have to multiply those talents and do good with them. So there is a lot of pressure. There's pressure for everyone to be the very best person that they possibly can be. And like I said, God's will is so much greater than our own will. And God has intended for us all to be great saints, all to be great saints. It's amazing to think about that we could be the saints that, that people are reading about 500 years from now. And we shouldn't strive to be canonized saints, but we should be, we should want to be saints in heaven as close to our blessed mother as possible. We should strive to have as much merit gained for when we meet our Lord at the, our, the particular judgment. So I just want to make sure I take advantage of all the opportunities God has given me to glorify him, to grow in virtue, and to be a saint in wherever I'm placed throughout my life. Amen. That's beautiful. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Harrison. I, uh, often we end the show with, uh, with a prayer. We do it in Latin and English. Do you want to do a Hail Mary together? Let's do it. You want to do Latin or you want to do English? Latin. All right, let's do the Latin. All right. Oremos. I'll put the words on the screen for everybody to follow along with us. Nomini Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in molieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta, Sancta Maria, Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunt et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. Amen. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Pray. Nomi Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Well, Harrison, thank you so much for being with us, and uh, thanks for inspiring us. And um, it's it's wonderful to see a young man who is living for the Lord, living for the church, living for his wife, his children, and and using the platform that he has to evangelize other and share Christ with others, and Our Lady, and the scapular, and the sacraments, and all these things. So, thank you for what you're doing, and may God richly bless you. Thank you for having me. Yep. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ, you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty and pray the rosary every day. You pray the rosary every day, right, Harrison? Rosary every day. Every day. Every day. All right. God bless. Godspeed. Thank you so much, Harrison. Thank you. To the heights. To the heights.